By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I have such a fun and exciting match for you. I've got Titania's Rings, a green and white deck built around Titania's song, uh, against a Tron deck with black. So black Tron, it's got carrion ants, it's got of course the Tron lands, it's just a very original, very cool deck. It's got Xenic Poltergeist in there. It's I love playing against this deck because it's so original. It's been on the channel a few times and this match I think is going to be a lot of fun. Now before I start with the deck text, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to skip that section, maybe first watch the match and then do the deck text. The easiest way to do this is by checking the description below because there you will find the several timestamps one of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on MTG Games, it'll take you straight to the game action. And here I am going to continue with the deck decks. I'm actually going to start with the deck of my opponent. Let's take a look at this Tron Black deck. And here we see the deck of my opponent today, Tronny Tryhard. So what he's trying to do is assemble Tron, right? Maybe first focus on what Tron actually is. So Tron refers to three lands, Urza's Tower, Urza's Mine, and Urza's Power Plant. Now, when you have these lands separately on board, they just tap for one generic mana. But if you have all three, something special happens. The Mine taps for two, the Power Plant taps for two, and the Tower taps for three. So once you have Tron assembled, you have a lot of mana. What do you want to do with all that mana? Well, when we look at the deck here of Tron the Triart, I guess what he wants to do is make a giant... Uh, Dragon Engine, that would be super cool, by the way, he's playing a one-off. Uh, or make a really, just cast his Triskelions for really cheap, they're six, but when you've got these three Tron lands on turn three, you can start casting them already. And he's also playing with four Sangir Vampires, so there are some tricks here. And the card I really like in combination with the Tron deck is Carrion Ants. So Carrion Ants is an O1 creature originally printed in Legends, but it got a reprint in fourth edition. Uh, you can pay one, give it plus one, plus one. So if you have Tron lands, you can make a huge, you know, it would be super cool to see uh, Tronny kind of get his ants into action. He did so in the past when I played against him with my Elementals deck and he slaughtered me with his carrying ants. So I'm a little scared for the carrying ants, to be honest. Um, we're seeing a really interesting trick in this deck, by the way. It's called the Parfait Strategy. And uh, there are two artifacts in old school that you can deactivate by tapping them. Those two artifacts are um, Howling Mine and Winter Orb. So they're both in this deck. Now, what you can do is if the Howling Mine is tapped or the Winter Orb is tapped, the artifact doesn't work anymore. And there are uh, cards in here that allow you to tap them. We've got a Relic Barrier, which can tap an artifact. So he can use his Relic to tap down his Howling Mine. After he's drawn his extra card from the Howling Mine, he can tap it down. And that means that when it's my turn, I only tap one, uh, sorry, draw one card because the Howling Mine is tapped, so it is deactivated. And then the other card here is uh, Winter Orb. So Winter Orb, an artifact for two that says you can only untap one land during your untap step. Now, again, if he manages to tap that uh, before he takes on his turn, it means that he untaps all his land. For example, he can do it in my end step. And again, that means a one-sided Winter Orb. So it only works on me and not on him. So this strategy can be super, super, uh, super good. And um, the cool thing is he can use his Relic Barriers, but he can also do it in a much, much more cooler way. He can use his Phyrexian Gremlins. I think it's just uber cool. So Phyrexian Gremlins, a card from Antiquities, you can tap it to tap target artifact and it remains tapped as long as the Phyrexian Gremlins are tapped and you can choose not to untap the Gremlins. I think it's a super, I mean, look at it. It's it's a super cool card, right? It's, it's just fantastic. Um, we're also seeing some cards in his deck that are not going to be so useful against me because remember, I'm only playing with, well, mainly playing with, with artifacts that I want to animate with Titania's Song. And he is playing with, uh, I believe, two Ashes to Ashes, a sorcery from the dark that reads Exile to non-artifact creatures and Ashes to Ashes deals five damage to you. So Ashes to Ashes is usually... A really good card but against this deck in this match I think you're not really gonna like that Tronny maybe the ashes to ashes are just gonna like burn a hole in your hand I guess you can use them still to to destroy my uh, my birds of paradise I mean a lot of elves anyway talking about that let's take a look at my deck and here we see my deck Titania's rings so this deck is green and white and it's built around the card Titania's song Titania's song a card originally printed in Antiquities, reprinted later in Revised, is a green enchantment for one green and three that reads all non-creature artifacts become artifact creatures with power and toughness equal to their casting cost and they lose all other abilities. So for example, my Nevenerals disc just becomes a 4-4 artifact creature. Basically, 
kind of a Suchi without a downside, right? And my uh, Aladdin's ring, and that's of course the dream because it's eight to cast, becomes an eight, eight creature. So the dream here is to just cast a lot of artifacts, play my Titania song and like destroy my opponent with an angry Aladdin's ring and a walking huge book in the form of a gem day tome, just have all these objects come to life and kind of kill my opponent. I really kind of enjoy that idea. I don't know if you've seen the Disney movie Merlin where the wizard uh, moves house, you know, goes packing or goes on a journey and you see like all his cups and all his books, they all go into his travel bag, you know, they come to life because of a spell. That's kind of how I see this deck, you know, happening once I play the Titania song. Now, there is, of course, a dream in this deck, like in so many decks that I built, and the dream is that I can cast a Titania Song and an Armageddon in the same turn, and of course, I then already have the artifacts on board that I want to animate, right? So let's say I've got like a Aladdin's Ring uh, on the battlefield, then I want to cast first uh, an Armageddon, and of course, have enough mana in my pool to after that cast my Titania Song, because then my opponent has no lands, and he cannot even, you know, do anything when I have this huge walking talking ring that's eight eight ring i mean that's of course of nature power you know slamming into my opponent you know that would just be awesome and you can even take that dream further by saying let's combine that with a channel i mean channel can be super good in this deck because it allows me to just have as many generic mana as i want that means i can just dump my entire hand all my artifacts on the board and yes i got to pay life per mana but who cares if you know there's not going to be another turn anymore or at least the next turn I will win the game, I guess, because the artifacts that I play will then have summoning sickness. But I think you kind of know where I want to go to. Now, by combining this strategy with white, it's ideal because white gives me the control cards that I need in the form of disenchant, swords to plowshares, the Armageddon that I mentioned before, but also the one Wrath of God can be quite good in this deck. And of course, the balance. Balance works really well with artifacts because it doesn't look at artifacts. It looks at land, creatures, and hand size right? It doesn't look at enchantments or artifacts. So it works together really well in a Titania song strategy. Um, so this is my deck. As you can hear, I'm really excited about it. I've played it a few times. It's always been a lot of fun. Hopefully it's going to be a lot of fun against Strani today. Let's go to the match. Game number one, here we go. So I'm starting here with a duel into a Birds of Paradise, the 01 flyer you can tap for any color mana. And now we're not going to see a bolt to bird because my opponent is not playing with red. So that's good news for me. He is starting with a soul ring though into a brass man. So a 1-3 creature from Arabian Nights. This is, I believe, the 4th edition version. And I'm playing a forest here. Tapping 3. Okay, let's see what I can do. Perhaps a basalt monolith. No, okay, this is a disrupting scepter. That's pretty good. So Disrupting Scepter, pay three and tap, and then you force your opponent to discard a card from their hand. They can choose, however, what card that is. It's not a random discard. There we see the Dragon Engine. Is he going to attack with the Brass Man? He can deal one point of damage. Kind of looks like a good attack, right? Looks like he's choosing not to, passing the turn. Interesting here. I probably would have attacked. Let's see what I can do. There is another Savannah. Tapping three, activating the Disrupting Scepter. Let's see what he's going to discard. So he's a little bit into tank here, it seems, trying to find out what to discard. A Triskelion. Okay, I'm actually already really happy with using my Scepter. I wonder what else he's got in hand. Perhaps a Sengir Vampire. He's going to go up to five mana now. He's got two black as well, so perhaps a Sengir is coming. That would be, be a bit of a problem for me. Okay, there's a Howling Mine. Interesting. So that Howling Mine will help him to keep up with my Scepter. And there's the attack with the Dragon Engine. A 1-3 creature that he can pump, and he's pumping it into a 2-3. So for two mana, you can give it plus one, plus O. Oh. So he's dealing two points of damage. I'm dropping to 18, and now I can draw two cards because of that Howling Mine. There is a forest. So now I got to choose, right? Am I going to just use my Disrupting Scepter every time or am I going to try to play something out? It looks like I'm going to... Okay, I'm just going to use the Scepter. For a moment there, I thought I was tapping four mana. Got a lot of four casting cost artifacts in my deck. 
Jam Day Tome, for example, would be quite nice, but also a Nevenerals disc. I could blow up four permanents on the side of my opponent. My opponent will only lose one permanent. And look at that, he's discarding the Ashes to Ashes. That makes perfect sense. It's not really a good card against me. The only non-artifact creatures I have in the deck are the Birds of Paradise and the Lanor Elves. There we see a Relic Barrier, and this is ideal for you. Now he can do what I discussed in the deck deck. He can turn his Howling Mine off by tapping it down, and that means that he's going to draw two cards a turn, and I'm only going to draw one card. So this is a big problem for me. Attacking here with the Dragon Engine, and he's going to pump it up again to a 2-3. So I'm going to drop to 16. And drawing a card for turn, turn here. He's still not attacking with the Brass Man, by the way. Let's see what I can do. If I have an Evanerals disc, I feel like I should play it out right now. Looks like I'm a little bit in the tank here. Tapping four. And there's a Titania song. Wow. That is a little bit unexpected here. That's perhaps why I was thinking for so long. That means that my Disrupting Scepter is now a 3-3. It also means that my opponent no longer draws cards because the Howling Mine is now just turned into a 2-2 creature. And also the Soul Ring is turned into a 1-1. So I'm basically playing this Titania song to make sure that my opponent doesn't have card advantage anymore. And also, you know, he's going to be in a slight land problem because he missed a land drop earlier and he can no longer use the Soul Ring. So now he's playing another 2-2 creature in the form of a Howling Mine. And I think this is actually a good decision now that I look at it because it turns off his Howling Mine, it turns off his Soul Ring as a mana generator and he kind of needs five mana for his deck to play cards like Sengir Vampire and six mana to play Triskelion. So I think this is a good decision playing a Lanawar Elves here. Tapping four, I'm going to play out another artifact. Okay, here we see Rod of Ruin, which is now a 4-4 creature. So that is pretty good. So a 4-4 four, for four, 4, those are pretty good stats. And I can start attacking with it next turn. And I wonder if he's then going to maybe double block or do a block with a Dragon Engine and a Howling Mine. And a pass turn here by my opponent. This is a pretty interesting game. And I also haven't played out a single uh, Swords of Plowshares, by the way, or Disenchant. Both of those cards will be quite handy. I can first attack, for example, with my 4-4, wait until he declares blocks, and then disenchant before damage is dealt. And that way, maybe get a favorable blocking situation. I am attacking here with the 4-4, so kind of signaling here to my opponent, Trani Tryhard, that I'm holding a disenchant in hand. Although I think if you're Trani, I guess you still want to double block. think he's going to do this. He's actually going to uh, block on all three. This is a really good block. So he's going to do Brass Man and Howling Mine and his Dragon Engine. If I have a Disenchant or a Swords, I should definitely target the Dragon Engine here. Let's see what I have. Tapping one, I guess the Swords to Plowshares. Exactly. Having that Swords here. And I think I should Swords to Dragon Engine and then kill the Howling Mine. Yeah, so I'm killing the Dragon Engine. He's pumping it for one more, so he gets two life. He's going to go up to 22. And now I can distribute four points of damage, and I'm killing the, uh, the Howling Mine here. Ooh, look at that. I'm going to cast something else. Tapping four in second main. Ooh, there's an Armageddon! This is a big problem for my opponent. Casting that arm again, and that is great timing. And remember, I still have playing a land as well. I still have my Birds of Paradise and my Lanawar Elves to generate mana for me. This is a big problem. I still have my 4-4 and my 3-3. I wonder, though, if I should attack. Playing out another land, so I guess I had quite a lot of lands in my hand. I mean, the thing is, I can attack with the 4-4. I guess that's what I'm going to do. But again, he can... Make a pretty favorable block, so perhaps I have a disenchant in hand. Look at that. Blocking on Soul Ring, Relic Barrier. Oh, wait a minute. Soul Ring, Howling Mine, and Brass Man here. And remember, Brass Man has a big butt. It's three toughness. So, I mean, if I don't have a disenchant, 
And I guess I don't. I am killing here the Brassman and the Sol Ring. Meaning that my opponent still has two 2-2s two left. So if I attack with my 3-3, three, three, he can kind of double block. So that's not favorable for me. So I'm kind of stuck here. Perhaps I shouldn't have attacked with the 4-4. Four, four. And Trani is now finding some more lands. Two swamps and a, uh, I think that's an Urtsa's mine there. And I'm finding nothing yet. Just passing the turn. Four land now for my opponent. Tapping a green. Okay, there's a Soul Ring, which is just a 1-1 one, one creature. There's an Urtsa's tower. So he's got Urt... Ooh, Sengir Vampire. That is a problem. Sengir is a problem here. It's a 4-4 four, four flying powerhouse. I need to find a Swords here to deal with it. Or at least a 4-4 four, four creature from my side. I mean, a Nevenerals Disc, a Jende Tome. That would be great. But look at that. I'm just passing the turn. I haven't done that much, actually, in the last few turns. I'm really giving my opponent here a chance to get back. Oh, there is a Triskelion. And he can use his Strike, of course, to kill my Birds of Paradise and my Llanowar Elves. I think that's exactly what he does. It means the Trike is now a 2-2. Two -two. It also means that this Sengir cannot be blocked anymore. Four points of damage, gonna drop to 12. It's looking pretty bad for me. And I could kind of see this coming because, yeah, I kind of controlled the game because of the Titania song. I think it was a good play, but I couldn't really find a strong follow-up. Attacking now with my uh, Disrupting Scepter. I think this is a, a bad decision because now my opponent can attack on the swing back, or maybe I have a Wrath of God that would be quite good in this scenario. I do not. And look at that, he's killing my soul ring, and now he can attack me for nine. I think this attack with the scepter was really, really bad. A big mistake. There is another Triskelion. Oh, I think I'm dead. He can attack me for nine. Oh, he's actually going to kill my scepter. He could have killed me because now I take 9 points of damage. I'm going to drop to 3. And he could have killed me there with those uh, trike points. Maybe he wanted to do it this way. He wanted to get like a flavor win. But let's see what I can do. If I have a Wrath of God, that's the only thing that can save me. A Wrath or Balance. Balance? Oh, I do have a Balance. Oh, -ho! that is unexpected. I have a Balance. We both have one card in hand. Oh, and I'm sure my opponent is now hitting himself in the head thinking, why didn't I just use that trike to win the game instead of killing the Disrupting Scepter? Ah, uh, this feels really good, playing my Lana Rails in second main, passing to turn. There we have a Royal Assassin. Oh, this is really funny. So Royal, of course, the 1-1 uh, one -one creature that you can tap to destroy target tap creature. There is a Relic Berry, which is now a 2-2. This is a problem. Now I need to chump block if I don't have an answer. I guess I don't. Passing the turn, so he's going to attack. I got to... I mean, I could take the damage. Okay, I have a Disenchant. I could also Disenchant maybe the Titania Song. I think that wouldn't really be a bad decision. And look at this. There's the Netling Imp. So this is a nice old-school combo here. Netling Imp, Royal Assassin. Netling Imp can force a creature to attack. And Royal Assassin destroys target tap creature. So next turn. Oh, this is interesting. A Rod of Ruin. Oh, no, it's just a 4-4. Four, four. Just a 4-4. Four, four. So Netling Imp can now force. Oh, a Sorcerer's Queen. Even a nicer combo here now. But the Netling Imp can force my Llanowar Elves or, of course, my Rod of Ruin to attack, which is now a 4-4. Four, four. Then I attack as soon as it taps. He can kill it with the Royal. We're actually going to see that in action right now. So... He's forcing me to attack because of the Nettling Imp. I have no choice. I have to attack, and I was going to kill it. Yeah, that makes sense. And this is perfect here for my opponent. It's looking really, really bad for me. I guess the balance was great. Gave me some extra turns, but then, you know, you need to have luck on your side if you then still want to win the game. And here we see him destroying my Llanowar Elves after forcing me to attack with it with the Nettling Imp. Tapping four... And another creature, so a 4-4 in the form of a Jamdatome. 
but it's not going to help me much though. Tapping two, I believe I saw a winter orb there. Yeah, the winter orb is going to make matters even worse for me. And now when it's my turn, he's going to force me to attack with the book. And I mean, I, I, I'm dead, right? Again, a Wrath of God could maybe give me some space, forcing me here to attack. And uh, he's going to make it an 0-2, just because he can. And I'm not quite sure why it then dies, but anyway, it doesn't matter. There we see a power plant. Does that mean that he now has Tron? That's pretty funny. He's got an empty hand though, but he's got Tron. He can actually kill me now, attack me. Oh, of course that Winter Orb doesn't work. It's a 2-2 creature. Sorry guys, that's why he blocked it on the Winter Orb. Oh man, sorry, I kind of missed that. Anyway, doesn't really matter. Game one here, I thought it was pretty exciting. I think my play with Titania Song was the right move. Let me know in the comments below how you feel. Um, but yeah, in the end, I just didn't make it. And now we're going to shuffle up again. And we'll catch back up with, uh, with this duel in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So now I'm on the play after losing that first game. So I got to win this to stay in it. Playing a Soul Ring here. That's that's pretty good start. Hopefully that can help me deploy like an early Gem Day Tome or... Some other big artifacts. There's a power plant from my opponent here, Trani. Playing a forest in the pass. There is a mine. If he can find a tower, I'm in trouble. There's a relic barrier. He can use the relic to tap down my soul ring. That is unfortunate. Can I disenchant the relic? I think that would be really worth it. Yeah, disenchanting the relic barrier here. And passing the turn. Can he find an Urza Star? There's an Urza Star. He's got Tron turn three. This is insane. I'm so jealous. Are we going to see a trike? Howling mine, howling mine, <laughs> and a relic. This is so funny. At least I can draw one extra card, but man, uh, this is problematic. He's going to draw three cards next turn. It's like an Ancestral Recall. Oh, man. Armageddon. Okay, actually... You know, you have to do what you have to do, you know. Yes, I'm going to lose some lands, but I have to do it. I, yeah, okay, at least I can play a land after that. I mean, he's probably going to draw into lands as well, but I had to do something, right? It's again, he's kind of forcing my hand, just like he did in game one, forcing me to play out that early Titania song. Now he's forcing me to play out that uh, Armageddon. Playing out my Alonor Elves here and passing the turn. And again, he's going to draw three cards. Just, just insane. There is a Swamp. And passing the turn. Am I going to attack for one? I guess I am. I mean, it's far from ideal, but the damage is a damage. Okay, playing a Disenchant probably on the Relic Barrier. Yeah, exactly, because if he can no longer use the Relic, then at least I can draw extra cards as well, playing another Lanora Elves passing the turn. So he's going to draw three cards again, though. He's still a bit low on lands. I've got a lot of lands, so hopefully that can give me some advantage here. And he's already lost two Relic Barriers. He's playing with a full playset. And because he can no longer tap down the Howling Mines, it means I'm also going to draw three cards next turn. That's going to be really sweet. Ooh, there's a Scenic Poltergeist. So Scenic Poltergeist, you can tap it to animate target artifact, and it gains uh, power and toughness equal to its casting cost, but it keeps its abilities. But what he can do is he can animate his Howling Mine, attack with the Howling Mine, and then the Mine taps. So it's a really funny way to kind of tap your Mine. Oh man, this deck, it is so much fun to play against, but it's also kind of annoying right now because I, of course, also want to do my thing. But uh, my opponent is making it really tough for me here in this match. Tapping a green, another Lanawar Elves. And what am I going to do here? Attacking with both Lanawars. Interesting. I'm not sure if this is the right move because if my opponent decides to attack with the Howling Mine, I want to double block and kill it. 
So he's going to draw three. Amazing. I, th I think he's going to use the Xenic Poltergeist on the Howling Mine. I mean, it would be a good move, right? Okay, there we see a power plane. He's got four mana now. He needs five to start casting his Sangears. Exactly, he's animating the Howling Mine, so it's now a 2-2. This is epic. I mean, <laughs> I've never seen this before. Animating the mine. Oh, going to 18. So yeah, I really should have kept my Llanowar Elves there on blocking duty. But now I know I'm probably not going to do it again. So now I'm only going to tap uh, two. I'm uh, sorry, going to draw two because that Howling Mine is tapped. That's what I'm trying to say. It looks like my opponent wants to do something else, playing a Royal Assassin second main and a Brass Man. Wow. So what am I going to do now? It looks like I'm going to tap a white. And I'm going to destroy the Royal Assassin. Interesting. Royal, of course, being really good, but perhaps I should have killed the Howling Mine. Or the Xenic Poltergeist. Tapping four. What are we going to see? Six even. Oh, am I going to tap eight? Aladdin's Ring? That would be really sweet. Yep, Aladdin's Ring, and that is really cool and actually kind of a problem for my opponent because I can pay 8 and tap and deal 4 damage to any target. I can start doing that next turn. And remember, my opponent is playing with black, so black has no disenchants or crumbles or shatters. It's black. Doesn't even have a bounce spell. It's super bad against artifacts. So after this ring, I'm kind of feeling optimistic. And yes, I know he's going to draw three cards again, which is huge. But let's just hope he cannot find anything. Which is, the chances of that are pretty slim. You know, he's drawing three cards a turn, but whatever. You know, he's got now got five lands. So I'm expecting to see a Sengir here, to be honest. Playing with four Sengirs. And that's, of course, a problem because it flies. But again, I can kill it with my ring. Oh, a Gremlin! That is actually really good. Gremlin you can use. You can tap to tap target artifact. So that means that I actually got to kill the Gremlin next turn. Oh, man. That is, that's going to cost me eight mana to kill that Gremlin. That is not pretty. And look at this. He's not attacking with the Howling Mine. He could have attacked with the Howling Mine here. He's not doing it, though. So he's allowing me to draw three cards, which is good news. Hopefully, I can find, for example, a Swords as well. Now I gotta tap 8, activate my ring. I gotta kill the Gremlin, because the Phyrexian Gremlins can keep my ring tapped, so... I'm, I'm actually not really understanding why I'm doing this main, by the way. I can just give my, the turn to my opponent and, and, and do it in response to my opponent trying to tap my ring with the Fire Action Gremlins. So I'm assuming I'm targeting the Fire Action Gremlins with the ring. I mean, I gotta kill the Gremlins, right? Looks like I'm a little bit into tank here, though. Yeah, killing the Gremlins, okay. I think we're discussing what it does. And, and the fact that you can keep the Gremlins tapped to keep the ring tapped, that's the main reason to kill the Gremlins here. I think I should just pass, you know, because I need to keep two Lander Elves on blocking duty in case he wants to animate his Howling Mind again and attack. Yeah, passing the turn here. And again, of course, he's going to draw three cards. We're both drawing insane amount of cards. I mean, if he can find a trike, he's got six lands now. If he can find a trike, he can kill all my Lanor Elves. Yep, there's a trike. Here we go. This is bad news for me. He's going to kill all my Lanoors. And then he's going to animate. Oh, he's going to animate my ring. He's got oh, that's funny. That is a really good move because now I have seven mana. I don't have enough mana anymore to use my ring. Oh, 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 this is bad news. So what he's doing, he's animating my soul ring with Scenic Poltergeist and then dealing one damage with it with Triskelion. This is a brilliant move. And this is a huge problem for me. I mean, at least I get to draw three cards, so I assume I'm going to find another land, right? 
Okay, good. I was, for a moment, I was worried. I really need to start using my ring on end step instead of in the main phase. I guess I just want to use the ring so bad that I keep doing it main. I mean, this is not a good, this is not a good way to play the game. I mean, I'm just really not using the ring the way I should. I guess I'm not killing it main because I don't want my opponent to then have the option to, in response in his turn, use Xenic Poltergeist to animate the mind attack with it. So I guess it kind of make makes a little bit of sense from that perspective. But the fact that I'm tapping out all the time, I don't like it. And now he can attack me for three, but I'm still on 18, so it's not too bad. However, I'm still kind of expecting my opponent here to play out a Sangir Vampire. Tapping seven. Okay, there is a Trike. And, ooh, I guess he's got Tron now, by the way. So he's casting the Triskelion and the Sangir Vampire. This is a big problem. Now he's going to attack for three, right? Exactly. Going to put me on 15. I actually need a Neveneros Disc. A Neveneros Disc, um, a balance will be quite good. Wrath of God, the one Wrath of God in the deck will be quite good. There is another forest. Okay, it's not really what I'm looking for. Tapping four. What am I going to do? Play a Neveneros disc. Okay, so I've got the disc. Let's hope that the disc can stick. Please let the disc stick. I'm on 15. He can attack me next turn for... Okay, at least this is a blocker or it takes away a counter from the Triskelion. Yeah, it takes away a counter. Okay, fine. Who cares? It saves me a damage, you know, that's, that's the way I look at it. He's probably going to untap the Brass Man here. Okay, so he can attack me for three, five, nine points. I'll be on six. That is not too bad. Remember, he doesn't have any direct damage. There are no Drain Lives in the deck. I don't think he's got a Howl from Beyond in the deck. Which would be pretty cool if Tron, by the way. Now he's asking what I have. Oh, he's playing a Mind Twist. Man, that's pure evil. That is pure evil. That is evil. Oh my god. What's on? What, what does it say on that mind twist? Something 2020. Oh man. My hand is gone. He can attack me for nine. Put me on six. My only hope, every, my, all my eggs are in one basket. The basket is called Navanero's Disc. If I can just untap, draw three cards because of the Howling Mine, hopefully you have like a good draw, detonate the disc, you know, and just start fresh. Okay, there's the attack. There we go. So five, nine points of damage, going to drop to six. I so want to stay in this game. Please do not kill me. Please give me one more turn. Let me untap the Neveneros disc. He's discarding a mine here. That is good news. Drawing three. Pop the disc. Play something useful. Pass the turn. That's what I want to do. And if I cannot play anything useful, maybe then... Let's see, how much mana do I have? I've got eight mana, so I can deal... Four points of damage, put him on 14, and then I can pop the disc. My hand must really be mediocre that I'm doing this. <laughs> but okay, popping the disc here. Because, I, of course, I don't want my opponent to draw three cards from the Howling Mine. So popping the disc, two cards in hand, passing the turn. So we're starting all over again. The problem here, of course, is that my opponent's got Tron, more cards, more cards in hand than me? I think so. And he's got more life than me. So it's not ideal, but it could be worse. I could be dead, you know? So it's better than being dead. I'm still in it. He's on 14. I'm on 5. Playing a Swamp here. 
Remember, he's got Tron, so he's got two, five, seven, nine, ten. Uh oh, he's counting his mana. I don't like that. He's got 14? 14 mana, I think. Four black, no, five black and nine generic. The fact that he's counting his mana, I mean, he doesn't have a black fireball, does he? Then again, I wasn't expecting the mind twist, so. It looks like he is going to play something, perhaps a Triskelion. Carrying ants will be very deadly as well, by the way. Look at this. He's tapping quite a lot. What is he going to do? Trike? And a carrion ants. Oh no, not the carrion ants. I am so dead. And I'm only going to draw one card. Because there are no more howling mines. Oh, he's also going to play a royal assassin. He's just flooding the board, and he did this earlier in the game as well. Tapping two, there's a disenchant on the trike, but then I'm still going to take three points. I'm going to go down to two. And I need something else here. Tapping four. Okay, this is actually pretty good. Can I still use Rod of Ruin? It's three to use, right? So I can use... The Rod of Ruin to kill the Carrion Ants. That's kind of nice. That's going to buy me a turn, actually. Okay, using it here, killing the Carrion Ants. I'm still alive. I'm still in it. I mean, I'm on two. Royal Assassin is a 1 1. Let's wait and see. Not sure what we're discussing at the moment, but I mean, he's got he's got tons of mana. You don't even have to count it when you've got so much mana. You can just say, "I've got enough mana. I'm going to cast it." Anyway, what is he going to do here? I guess he was counting to see if he had enough mana to play out all the cards. But what a, what a ridiculous game this is. Again, I'm really enjoying this. Going to go down to one. Am I going to get one more turn? I hope so. What does he want to play out over there? Just pass the turn, man. I'm on one. Oh, he's going to flood the board with just a lot of creatures here. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this has got to be the end of the line, man. I need... I need a Wrath of God, or again, I need a Miracle. A balance would be really good. We saw that in game one. It kind of gave me some extra time, but it's all too little too late. I guess I can kill a creature here. Killing the Sorcerer's Queen. That kind of makes sense because it, it can make the creatures in O2. Yeah, this is not going to win it for me. Disrupting Scepter. And that's it, right? Passing the turn. I'm on one. Passing the turn. He's going to kill me with his army of one ones. I mean, that's very fitting when you're on one. It makes sense. Just, to t just kill me now. Go. And I'll take the damage from the Scenic Poltergeist first. Oh, look at that. I even have one Swords in hand. It's not going to be enough, though. So I'm going to lose this. Oh, a 2 0. Oh, so both games here are going to go to my opponent, Tronny Triart. But don't go away yet because guess what? We decided to play a third game because these games are just too much fun, right? So um, buckle up and get ready for game number three. Game number three, here we go. So I'm two games down. So all I want to do in this game is just show you that my deck can win. Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, it can win. But here we see. Tron and Triard, though, starting with an Urza's Tower, I really don't want to see that turn three natural Tron again. That was just killer in game number two. Playing a Savannah here, by the way, in passing turn. And, oh, an Urza's Mine from the top. If he can find a power plant next turn. Yuck. What if I'm, I'm, I have to play against a Triskelion turn three? That's going to be deadly. Anyway, let's see what I can do here. Tapping three. Okay, Disrupting Scepter. 
Hopefully he doesn't assemble Tron here. I think that was a Sengir Vampire that he just drew. So there's a swamp. Just, just, just let me, you know, give my deck a chance, please. Please, Tronny. Using my scepter here, forcing my opponent to discard, discarding a swamp. I'm missing a land drop here. Oh, that's not great. Tapping three. There's a scenic poltergeist. There's that card again from Antiquities. Remember, tap to animate target non-creature artifact into an artifact creature with power toughness equal to the casting cost. Let's see what I can do here. Tapping a green, playing a Lanawar Elves. It's all so slow. It's all so, my my deck is just not doing what it's supposed to do. Come on. If he can get land number five, he can start casting a Singer Vampire, and I'm in trouble again. There we see an Urza's Tower. He's gonna play a Soul Ring. Gonna use the Soul Ring. Oh, there's a trike. There's a trike. So he's gonna kill the Lanwer, of course. He can also attack me for one with the Poltergeist if he wants to. Ooh, he's changing his mind. Maybe he wants to exactly animate my scepter and kill my scepter instead. I understand. That's that's also a pretty good decision because the scepter can kind of be really annoying, forcing him to lose more cards in his hand. On the other hand, though, I mean, I am low on mana and the Lanawar Elves, I really need it. Tapping four for a Jam Day Tome. At least that's something. And passing the turn. I think I saw that Sengir, right? So I'm pretty sure he's going to play a Sengir Vampire. Doesn't have Tron yet. He's got two Urza's Towers and an Urza's Mine. Look at that, he's animating my book. And here he's making a mistake though, because Ashes to Ashes is non-artifact creature. And here's taking it back, he cannot destroy. Look, his idea was a good one though. He's like, I animate the book to make it a creature and then it can destroy two creatures. Unfortunately though, it can only destroy non-artifact creatures. So it was a good idea, but it just doesn't work. And here we see that Sengir Vampire 4-4 four, four flying powerhouse, big problem. I need, I just need a swords. If I next turn can play a land and a swords and I can draw a card and I can kill the vampire, that would be ideal. Taking two damage here, by the way, from the Xenic Poltergeist and the Trike, which is now just a 1-1. One, one. So he's passing the turn here. Let's see what I can do. Three cards in hand for my opponent. This is just really tough. Tapping two here. Playing a balance. I'm a little bit surprised about this balance. Although I am taking care of the lands, though he's got to put two lands away, two creatures away. The problem, of course, is that he can keep the same gear. So, I mean, the, look at that. Putting away a Nevenerals disc as well. Interesting. I wonder what else I have in hand. Perhaps a Swords here. To take care of the Sengir. Yep, there's the Swords on the Sengir. And I'm going to attack for one, putting him on 19. Interesting. I think that was a power plant, by the way. If that was a power plant, he's going to assemble Tron. Yep, that is a power plant. So he's got Tron now. That means he's got a lot of mana. Let's just hope for me there's nothing good in that hand. And he's just passing the turn, so that's good news for me. I know that one of those cards is an Ashes to Ashes, which is basically a dead card. But he's got 10 mana right now. He doesn't have a second black, though. So he needs, of course, a second black if he wants to cast, for example, a Sengir Vampire. He plays with a full playset of Sengirs, one Carrion Ants. Carrion Ants is super good, of course, now because he's got Tron. There's the second black though. Oh no. Oh no. Tapping five. I think we're going to see a Sengir. 
Xenic Poltergeist. Okay, okay. Could be worse. Xenic and the Howling Mind. This could be a lot worse. So I'm drawing two cards. I need to find some lands, by the way. I'm kind of stuck. Finding a forest. Tapping a white. Swords to Plowshares on the Xenic. I probably... I shouldn't attack, I think. I should just leave it. I, ah, this is not a good idea. I should just draw. I should draw, you know, because now I don't have four mana. Exactly. Changing my mind. I think this is a good decision. You want to keep your four mana to use your Jam Detome on the end step here of, uh, of my opponent. But this is bad news. I don't like it when he's got a Howling Mind and Tron. That's just waiting for trouble. There we go. There's a the Relic Barrier. This is trouble. I'm going to use the book. Hopefully I can find a Disenchant for the Relic Barrier. Because remember, Relic Barrier and Howling Mind means that I only draw one card because the Howling Mind's tapped and doesn't work, but he untaps it and draw draws two cards. So it's a super good uh, strategy. Tapping four here. Are we going to see a Nevenerals Disc, perhaps? A Titania Song. Okay, so I'm kind of doing what I did in game one. I think this is a really good decision. Attacking with my 4-4 book here, trying to put some pressure on, and with the Llanowar Elves. Dealing 5 points of damage, he's going to drop to 19. I'm still on 18. Now remember, he does have a lot of mana though. So hopefully I can find the right artifacts to put some pressure on. I, I, I use this strategy as well, of course, in game number 1. It kind of worked, but it eventually didn't. Look at that attacking here for 5, going to put me on 13. And he's going to pass turn, so I'm quite lucky here that he cannot find anything useful to cast, despite the fact that he's got a lot of mana. Finding another planes. I think I should be really careful with my attacks here. Attacking with the book. So dealing 4 more points of damage, I guess. Going to put him on 15. Tapping 3. What could I have? Power Monolith? Of a Bessel Monolith, perhaps? No? And another book. Okay, now it's looking quite good. Remember, these are all creatures. Disrupting Scepter is 3 to cast, so it's a 3-3. Three, three. Jam Day Tome is 4 to cast, so it's a 4-4 four, four because of the Titania Song. And there's a Relic Barrier, which, uh, barrier, which is just a 2-2, two, two, though. So next turn, I can attack with one of the books and offer him a trade. Then he would have to double block, losing two artifacts, and I will only lose one. So that's pretty good. Seven mana. If it can find one more mana, and I have an Aladdin's Ring, that would be really funny. Look at this. Attacking with everything. Putting on full pressure here on my opponent. And perhaps keeping mana open to play a Disenchant when the blockers are declared. Or, of course, a Swords to Plowshares. So here we see a double block. It's kind of hard to follow here what he's going to block. It looks like he's going to do a double block on the... Disrupting Scepter. And he's going to do a Chump Block on the book. I'm responding here with a Swords. So killing one of the Relics. That means he's going to lose the other one with the block. And he's going to take 4 damage from that book. He's going to drop to 11. But of course he's going to gain life as well. 2 life from the Swords. He's going to go back up to 13. I have to say I am slightly optimistic here. I actually don't even want to say it because I feel like game one and two, I had a lot of bad luck. But in this game three, I'm slightly optimistic. We're both on 13. He only has that one Howling Mind. He's passing the turn, not finding anything. Okay, playing a forest. I've got eight mana. Am I going to cast? Am I going to do it? Oh, yes. Here we go. Aladdin's Ring. Titania's Ring activated. Yes, that was the goal. I'm just really happy here. Having my 8-8 eight, eight ring. That is awesome. Attacking here for 11. Putting my opponent on 2. Ah, you gotta love the life. You gotta love the life. I mean, he needs a miracle, right? I don't think he has one. There's no balance in black. There's no wrath of God. Look at that hand. He's going nowhere. But I'm gonna take my time, though. I'm gonna untap. And I'm going to attack exactly with everything. Ho-ho! 
Yes, so even though I lost this match, this third game feels really, really, really sweet. Thank you, Trondy Tryhard, for uh, for giving me that game number three, allowing me that joy. Um, and yeah, I just had a lot of fun playing this game against you. Thank you for bringing such an original and cool deck to the table. And like I said, we've seen this deck on the channel before. I'll actually put a link to those two uh, match videos in the description below. So if you haven't seen those episodes, check them out. They're actually, uh, they were actually a lot of, uh, of fun. I mean, it's always fun to play uh, against uh, against Trondi Tryhard, AKA Yoop Buck. It's just a lot of fun, a lot of creative decks. And uh, before you go, by the way, don't click away yet. Please take a moment to like, share, and comment on this video. These things are completely free and they really help the channel move forward. And um, of course, if you're not a subscriber yet, please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. All these things really, really help. And um, yeah, you know, do me a favor, it, uh, it helps, it's all it's all completely free. Um, there's one last thing that you can do and you can also become a patron of the show. And that means that you can sponsor Timmy Talks and you can help me keep the channel afloat. It already starts for just $1 a month and you can do that via patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. There's probably an info card popping up right now and if you click there, it'll take you to the Patreon website. So please have a look and if you join the Patreon site, um, the cool thing is that you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. You can join all the Timmy Talks online events, like the tournaments that I organize. And um, you know what? Maybe I'll just send you a, a nice button of the channel as well. Anyway, check out the uh, Patreon page for all the ins and outs and all the details. Uh, and then I guess it's now time to go to the end scroll and have a look at our fantastic, amazing, wunderbar patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Here we go. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Ik het als ik het als somba kan zien.